would be interesting to discuss, like, what are the consequences of this kind of influence the Chinese Communist Party has on a uh, local level in the U.S., not just governors, but you mentioned state legislatures. It goes, it goes all the way down. Uh, yeah, what are the consequences of this? I know you mentioned the solar panel industry. That's a great example. Yeah, I think it makes sense to put this influence campaign and its consequences in terms of you know, this is a mechanism through which China can implement its larger strategic vision. And what are the consequences of that at a local level? So in exerting subnational influence, China tries to acquire American resources. So for example, intellectual property. Um, it tries to cement a role for itself in critical American supply chains and ultimately to hollow out U.S. capabilities in those in order to foster dependence. So solar would be a great example there. Also, China cannibalizing the automotive industry in Michigan would be another example there. Um, China also tries to do a similar thing in trade relationships to make sure that local economies rely on trade with China, um, as, for example, in agricultural states. Could you talk a little bit more about like either the solar or the the car manufacturing, um, like how that how they hollowed that out through the use of this? Yeah. So in the early 2000s, America dominated um, production of polysilicon, which is the critical input for solar panels. Um, and really, the U.S. dominated most solar energy production and industrial capacity and had major technological advantage in this field. Beijing began to prioritize the industry um, and in doing so set about investing in partnering with and acquiring U.S. players in the field in order to obtain their intellectual property as well as um, generally like the expertise or know-how or processes. That was a larger effort, um, which ultimately, in large part because of Chinese government subsidies, allowed them to overtake American solar producers, such that today the entire industry is controlled by China. China makes the majority of the world's polysilicon. You really can't make a solar panel without Chinese products. A number of... So when you look at China's subnational influence, for example, the uh, programs, for example, the Governor's Forum in the 2010s, you see a host of agreements in the solar sector being formed. So at a Governor's Forum, there were agreements about China investing in a solar production facility in a state or um, committing to partner on a different one. And those are the kind of agreements that ultimately fueled Beijing's effort to leapfrog in this industry. And they also did the same to the automobile industry, because I didn't realize that was happening with cars. So it's less um, direct or at least less clearly played out in the vehicle sense. But especially since 2015, China has acquired a number of auto relevant facilities, especially in Michigan. Um, But because that's not a sector uh, sector hub, but really throughout the United States. Um, a number of the Chinese companies that have done this are state-owned players. So AVIC has really led the charge. And they've done it in large part via interaction with state-level leaders. But it, like, we're not buying Chinese cars in the U.S. So what, like, what are they acquiring? So there are two things probably that um, are the most obvious in terms of the implications. First is that China doesn't dominate right now OEMs for cars, but the par- like auto parts and things that go into the ultimate finished car product, um, a number of those value chains are dominated by China. Well, tires actually is a good example of that. Um, through acquisitions, primarily actually overseas acquisitions, less um, domestic companies, uh, China has become probably the leading player in tire manufacturing. There are other, like, you know, much more technical auto parts that I can't pull up um, top of mind, but um, China plays a much more significant role, just if you look at, like, trade flows in terms of the things that together constitute a vehicle rather than the vehicle itself. So if I buy an an American car made in America by General Motors, uh, it could still have Chinese tires and Chinese uh, electronic components and that sort of thing inside this American car. Exactly. 
Um, but the other beat is that Beijing is competing not just for like the legacy automobile industry, but especially for the electric vehicle industry. And that's somewhere where you know leapfrog capabilities and capabilities that are fueled in large part by, or at least in part by, partnerships with advanced international players, um, including through investments, in order to acquire uh, capabilities. So if you look at the emerging electric vehicle landscape, Chinese players are pretty huge in it. Um, and or even in the even in like companies that aren't Chinese players, Chinese investment and also reliance on major parts like batteries. I mean, we've been telling Elon Musk not to go to China, but he won't listen to us. He's I mean, already my, there. Yeah, I mean, my my fear is that within you know two years from now, China will basically dominate the electric vehicle uh, battery industry. So it's not that you're going to buy Chinese cars, but your your American car, your Tesla, will actually have a Chinese battery, and uh, will be dependent on that Chinese we'll battery, right? Yeah, and then like we won't even be able to make the batteries in the U.S. anymore. And not just that, but things like the Build Back Better plan, uh, you know, actual in American investment and subsidization of uh, you know, green energy, you know, building solar power plants, it's, but it's, 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 it's all it's, helping China. Well, it's, it's you know, green, but the cobalt is mined by children in the, you know, DR Congo and then the other parts, you know, it's put together by Uyghurs in Xinjiang. The polysilicon, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's, made in Xinjiang. The, the, the Uyghur slave uh, laborers are actually quite good at putting together the polysilicon, I've heard. Yeah, but yeah, just U.S. taxpayer money going to ultimately Chinese companies in the green sector, especially if they dominate the electric vehicle market. And just on the EV stuff with batteries, I think we're pretty much already there. Like cattle or, and other Chinese battery manufacturers supply for pretty much every major EV maker out there. Um, and also like we're already buying Chinese um, electric buses and things that aren't specifically vehicles. Um, they're already there in terms of the like fully assembled um, vehicle. And I don't think it's a huge leap to think that that could happen you know, to the vehicles themselves, not just their batteries within the next five years. This really is like the Belt and Road. Like there's all this promise of economic investment and development. And in the end, it just ends up gutting the local government. It's, it's, <laughs> it's just all, all the rest of us have to buy from China. Uh, but the our, I mean, I think the one piece that's different is, well, maybe it's not different. I don't know. Like, our local uh, our local U.S. states, are they getting loans from Chinese companies and th uh, Chinese banks and that kind of thing? Um, yeah, I think that would be a big difference, except that in, in, you know, to an extent you have the same thing play out just for our big companies. Like during the financial crisis, China bailed out GM. Um, and... I mean, that's obviously different than our states getting bailed out by China, but it kind of leads to a similar dynamic. I think another thing that's different than Belt and Road and like probably worse is that China's not just creating dependence and hollowing out our industry. It's also using this influence campaign to acquire our like advanced tech resources. So it's kind of getting us from like both top and bottom. Um, in terms of like, you know, the very bottom level, like dependence ability to make something, but also the very high level, like our advantage in technological leadership. I'm just really depressed right now. That's, that's <laughs> bleak. 